The next item of business today is a member's business debate on motion number 11796 in the name of David Stewart on educational psychologist numbers at dangerously low levels in Scotland. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put and I'd be grateful if those members who wish to speak in the debate could press the request to speak buttons as soon as possible. I call on David Stewart to open the debate. Seven minutes, please, Mr Stewart. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. I'd like to thank, um, first of all, all members across the Chamber who have taken the time to sign my motion and to attend today's debate. And also, I'd like to extend my thanks to the many organisations that provided briefings ahead of the debate on this important uh, issue. My concerns about educational psychology numbers in Scotland is one that I've previously raised uh, with the former Cabinet Secretary, Mike Russell, on a number of occasions. This was sparked by a constituent from Murray. The young student's anxieties about the future of educational psychology struck a chord with me and has led to today's debate. Ed educational psychology training in Scotland has been described as a ticking time bomb facing the sector by the, Scot by the Scottish Children's uh, Service uh, Coalition. It was first raised with me in the autumn of 2013 when a young, bright and enthusiastic constituent came to discuss the numerous issues and challenges facing those seeking to work as educational psychologists and the pressure on those currently working. The challenge facing educational psychology in Scotland is really twofold. Firstly, firstly, uh, sorry, firstly there's a shortage in the number of trained educational psychologists currently practising in Scotland. This has been described as dangerously low by the National Association of Scottish Principal Education Psychologists and the Scottish Division of Educational Psychologists. Their report in 2013 concluded that educational psychology faced an impending crisis. As it stands today, up to a quarter of Scotland's current educational psychologists could retire within the next four years, and there are far too few new postgraduate trainees coming into the field to replenish these numbers. This leads to a second and interconnected challenge in the training of new educational psychologists and the point my constituent raised uh, directly with me. As members will know, the Scottish Government took the decision to scrap the bursary paid to train the educational psychologists in 2012. That means that each individual student is responsible for meeting the entire £18,000 uh, university tuition fees from their own pockets. In addition, there's the burden of covering living expenses of food, travel and accommodation over the two years postgraduate course. And that puts even more uh, debt for those who have accumulated debt during under undergraduate study. Uh, students who are accepted into the course and who want to take part in the financial burden are eligible for, of course, for a career development loan of around 3,400 uh, across the two year period. This leaves a massive shortfall of over 14,000. So this is a huge financial burden. It's crippling to those currently on courses, and it's led to 70% reduction in applications from new candidates since the crucial uh, funding was removed. The Canada Report of 2001 had reviewed the provision of edu educational psychology services. And the Minister's forward warned them of the urgent need to recruit and train more educational psychologists. So what we've seen, uh, presiding officer, is a growth in the uh, numbers of, of children identified as facing additional uh, support needs, which has more than doubled uh, to, from 2010 uh, to currently 2014. So I believe that what we need is to reintroduce uh, bursaries for students. We need to give local authorities the minimum amount of psychologists that we need to operate this system. Otherwise, I believe we will have a meltdown in educational psychology, and I call on the government to think again and reintroduce minimum numbers and reintroduce bursaries. Thank you, President Officer. Many thanks. Um, we turn to the open debate speeches of four minutes, please, and I call George Adam to be followed by Malcolm Chisholm.
Thank you, President Officer, and I thank David Stewart for bringing this to the Chamber. The reason I want to talk about this is, uh, and participate in this debate is for two very practical reasons. And it's not just about the educational psychologists. I think uh, some of the points brought up by Mr Stewart are quite accurate in so much that there are quite a number of families having to deal with uh, uh, members of the family with learning difficulties and being autistic uh, uh, within the autistic scale. And from my own reason is I've got ongoing constituency cases where Renfrewshire Education Authority are letting my constituents down in this case. Things like uh, not actually giving support to autistic uh, young people who have timetables, not actually uh, almost giving them an empty timetable because they don't have the support there. And I think this is something that local authorities should be looking at one another and looking at themselves to see how do they actually deliver and support these families. And I'm also coming from very personal reasons as a father of a son who has learning difficulties. Now, he's now 23. But us as a family had to go through some of the situation that many families are still going through at this stage as well. So I would say that in my case in Renfrewshire, the issues have been there for a long time in the local authority. And the difficulties that families face now are very similar to the difficulties that we faced then as well. And uh, I think the local authorities would have to say, are they supporting families and young people uh, enough in this case? You know, educational psychologists are extremely important and they're there to support the learners. But I do believe that the Additional Support Act does give the opportunity to enable parents and young people to request the education authority to arrange for a child or young person to have an assessment. Uh, and it's up for that a particular education authority to decide who is the appropriate person to a uh, particular process to actually deal with that assessment. Now, as a parent and as a, pa uh, as a uh, parliamentarian and representative of the people of Paisley, they, we, them and myself, don't care who makes the decision and who actually does it. We just need the support to make sure that that family and that child gets the opportunity to go forward. And I think when we're talking about this, we have to talk in partnership. Us working along with the, the Scottish Government, working as it does with uh, local authorities to ensure that we can deliver that. Because uh, in a lot of cases, uh, I'm finding at constituent level that uh, families just don't seem to be getting that support from when their, uh, their children have special needs. And as I say, this has been an ongoing issue, both in the past and uh, in the present as well. And uh, when you have to look at we have to make sure that uh, we, we, we support these families because I, I'm aware that some local authorities, there's been issues in other uh, parts where we have BSL teachers uh, uh, being able to help classes in primary schools and ensuring that deaf children have the opportunity to engage fully with uh, their classes. And I think this is a perfect example because some local authorities, like uh, one of the Ayrshire ones, actually have pulled, or the Ayrshire authorities have pulled the resources to make sure that they can actually find out the area where they need to put these professionals in. And it's one of the things that came up when we, as the Education Committee currently this year, looked at the budget. And we looked at the fact that how we're delivering secondary and primary school education. And one of the problems that kept coming out was the joint working and joint and services with local authorities just wasn't happening. They weren't actually working together to do these type of things. Now, I would think in this case, in order to work with local authorities, I would think the best way for them would be to, for them to work with one another to find if there are areas and uh, districts that have a higher incidence of uh, children or young people who have learning difficulties or need that extra support so that they can actually put that uh, support into that local authority. And I think it's another example of how local authorities could possibly work better and smarter with one another as opposed to just uh, de looking at it. So on that, in closing, presiding officer, I'd just like to say I welcome this debate, but it's not quite as simple as the motion itself puts. It's quite complex and there's a lot involved here. And I think we should maybe work with local authorities to try and help them, but they as well must take responsibility for some of the services that they offer. Thank you. Um, I now call Malcolm Chisholm to be followed by Mary Scanlon. Uh, uh, I congratulate Dave Stewart for bringing forward this uh, important debate today and for highlighting the disparity between the supply of vital psychological uh, support and the demand for it. The motion encapsulates this in terms of 394 educational psychologists currently and we need 
over uh, 1,000. And that disparity exists in spite of the fact that educational uh, psychology as a statutory function and, and clearly is crucial to the national priority uh, of supporting early and effective intervention and is, is also uh, essential for important and admirable uh, government strategies such as GERFEC and important legislation such as the Children and Young People's uh, Bill. Uh, without this support, many children uh, and young people will continue to struggle uh, with learning, without proper assessment, without a clear plan uh, for their education uh, path, and with detrimental consequences for their mental and emotional uh, well-being. We should also remember that educational psychologists are critical uh, to planning for young people in care and provide specialist advice in a variety of education contexts, from casework advice to whole school analysis and strategic uh, development. So uh, I've been around uh, long enough to remember uh, similar uh, issues being raised in the early years of this parliament and indeed in the two years before the start of this parliament. I remember Brian Wilson as education minister between 97 and 99 uh, increasing uh, the numbers uh, of educational psychologists and I remember Cathy Jamieson in the early years of this parliament conducting uh, a review uh, into this whole issue and we had a report in 2002 with 30 important recommendations many of which are still relevant today. And I noticed that the National Scottish Steering Group for Educational Psychology in 2013 also recommended a review uh, with a view to developing a national framework. So I hope uh, the Minister and the Scottish Government will uh, consider uh, that uh, recommendation because it's just as relevant uh, today as it was two years uh, ago. Now, one fundamental problem, as Dave Stewart, of course, emphasised centrally uh, in his uh, uh, opening speech, uh, is the loss uh, of the bursary. If we are serious about making sure no child slips through the system without diagnosis and support, we have to revisit the decision to remove the bursary paid to trainee educational uh, psychologists. The motion refers to £25,000 to self-fund course fees, travel and living expenses. And this is thought to be uh, directly connected to the 70% drop in applicants for educational psychology uh, courses. And Dave Stewart also reminded us, of course, that this is particularly serious when we're advised that, uh, that, that, that a quarter of educational psychologists may uh, retire in the next uh, four years. Uh, Emma Brown, Chair of the Scottish Division of, of, of Educational Psychology Training Committee, highlighted uh, this significant concern as long ago as 2012, uh, as soon, uh, very soon after the significant change in the bursary provision uh, was made. She said uh, then that the change would affect, and I, and I quote, equality of access for candidates to courses, quality of future educational psychology graduates, and educational psychology services' ability to fulfil their duties locally and nationally. She also appealed to the Cabinet Secretary at that time to consult with professional bodies about this important matter, and it seems that that did not happen. Certainly no change took place, so I hope the Cabinet Secretary and the Minister who is replying to the debate today will consult uh, with uh, professional bodies uh, will consider a review in a national framework, as I suggested earlier on, and most of all, will revisit uh, the decision to remove the bursary. Thank you very much. I now call Mary Scanlon to be followed by Jenny Mara. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. Can I also thank David Stewart uh, for securing this debate on the shortage of educational psychologists. I think it's important to point out that there are shortages of psychologists across most disciplines, although today we're only looking at the shortage in one particular area. With a 100% increase in the number of children uh, recorded with additional support needs and a fairly static number of educational psychologists, we do have a very urgent problem. We had an urgent problem in 2002 and it's even more urgent now. Of course, I do appreciate that not every child with ASN needs, needs to see a psychologist, but for those who need to, we should be doing all we can to help. Educational psychology profession estimates a need for over 1,000, and yet we currently have around 400. The 25% re due to retire in five years will bring this down to 300 with 700 vacancies. At the Health Committee uh, some years ago, we were told there's a window of opportunity at certain ages of a child's development. 
If that window of opportunity is missed at that age, it's missed forever. It's too late. And I think that's what is critical here. And it's not as if this issue has come to the Scottish Government's attention. It's not as if it's new. I asked several questions in August this year and was met with the response from Mike Russell, and I quote, We are working in partnership with the National Scottish Steering Group for Educational Psychologists to ensure a sustainable supply of educational psychologists to meet potential future needs. That was over five months ago, and I'm hopeful today that the partnership working for, uh, uh, over the period of time will result in some positive news in the summing up by the Minister. And as Malcolm uh, Chisholm said, we're very good at passing legislation in this Parliament on named persons, additional support needs, and stating that there's a statutory requirement for local authorities in Scotland to provide educational psychology services. And yet, when it comes to ensuring that the appropriately qualified and trained people are in place, their funding is cut, resulting in a 70% decrease in applications for training. And as Malcolm, uh, I was going to say Rifkin, uh, Chisholm also said, uh, educational psychologists, they're not just an added extra, it's not just a little hobby course, they are essential to addressing inequalities, something the government says they're in favour of. They're essential to promoting early and effective intervention to support the well-being of children and young people across Scotland. They play a valuable role in establishing the continuity of support for children and young people in the often very difficult transition uh, from child to adult services and also other key services. And yet the last Scottish Government review on the provision of educational psychology services was in 2002, 13 years ago. So this hardly sends out a signal that this is a valued and essential workforce, critical to the health and well-being of children across Scotland. And I think we're all agreed across this chamber that attainment in schools is a major challenge. We can all agree on that. And a major function of educational psychologists is to address inequality and the gaps in attainment and achievement outcomes of the vulnerable and at risk in society. Uh, so I would just go on to say that uh, the Scottish Government constantly tell us that higher education is based on the ability to learn, not the ability to pay. Well, that's not the case for educational psychologists. And can I just finally say I thought George Adams' contribution was excellent. And can I ask the Minister to explain what recourse do parents have when councils fail to provide an educational psychologist when it is deemed as a statutory requirement? Thank you. Thank you. And I now call Jenny Mara to be followed by Jim Hume. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I, I come to the Chamber on this topic really quite disappointed because this is a, an issue that I had raised with Mike Russell on at least a couple of occasions in this Chamber before and I believe with Alistair Allen also. The Government has really let this situation come about, um, especially over the last few years. And since members, members across this Chamber have raised their concerns, they've not taken any action to do um, anything about it. Presiding officer, um, I think it's often useful to look at the, the truth and the stories behind some of the statistics that we are presented with. And I, I'm looking at the, the briefing paper that we received today from the National Scottish Steering Group for Educational Psychologists. And in uh, table four, it has the um, number of applicants, withdrawals and number of students that took up courses at each of the four universities that offer uh, the qualification in educational psychology. When the bursaries were changed uh, for the intake in 2012, I noticed that uh, 13 withdrawals were made from the course at Dundee University. Presiding officer, one of these withdrawals came to my surgery in Dundee and told me her story. Uh, she was a very well qualified um, 
she was a very well qualified Oxford graduate who was working in our schools in Angus, uh, Minister. She was a young teacher. She was, had a great rapport with the young people she was teaching in quite a deprived area. Um, so much so that she wanted to train to become an educational psychologist. However, the funding arrangements that were chained by, changed by the government precluded her from doing so. And she presented we, me with. Um, being a very conscientious uh, young woman, she presented me with all the information available to her and she said to me, it actually makes more sense for me to go back down south and train as an educational psychologist there. I can afford to train there and I will have to relocate uh, my, my husband and go and live there and work in a school there. I thought it was a great shame when that young woman left my surgery that day that the children of our broth or the children of the North East of Scotland would not, uh, would no longer have her services in, in the very um, important area of um, educational psychology. And I think Liz Smith was right during First Minister's questions to draw the link between mental health and educational psychology, because we know that um, educational psychology is a preventative measure and is an early intervention in mental health. And I also think of the waiting lists to see educational psychologists in my home city of Dundee. And I've spoken again to the parents who have come to my surgeries, anxious that they're worried that there's something not quite right um, about their children's behaviour or about their children's happiness or about their general well-being. And they are not able, they're told there is a waiting list of weeks and weeks and weeks to see an educational uh, psychologist. I think um, Mary Scanlon was right to point out that this is a statutory duty, this is a legal duty of this government to provide these services. And the fact that the government have now been in place for eight years, but have let our workforce age to the point where we're actually about to lose most of our uh, qualified educational psychologists is extremely worrying. I would end, presiding officer, on the point about the preventative agenda. I said this in the chamber a few weeks ago. I think Every minister in Nicola Sturgeon's cabinet needs to take the Christie Commission off their shelves and dust it down because those recommendations that Campbell Christie spent a long time working on were about a preventative agenda in our public services. I think educational psychology is a very good example of that. I would urge the minister to rethink uh, the bursary options and the number of uh, educational psychologists that he is going to train. Thank you. I now call Jim Hume to be followed by Mark Griffin. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. <coughs> like others, I congratulate David Stewart on bringing this important de debate to the Parliament. What David Stewart's motion highlights is an, an imbalance in educational psychologists in Scotland. Demand is ris has risen and is rising, and supply is falling. Combine that with an ageing workforce, and it all points to a worsening situation. The Scottish Division of Educational Psychologists report states that a quarter of educational psychologists may retire in just four years. That's alarming. According to the Workforce Planning Meeting for Educational Psychologists in November 2011, approaching a third of educational psychologists in Scotland are aged 55 and over and are likely to retire over the next five years. Now, George Adam uh, mentioned that, or hinted at this uh, not being a, a, a new problem, it's been on, ongoing, but the Scottish Children's Services Coalition highlighted the increased demand that we face now. Children with additional support needs has increased from 69,587 in 2010 to more than double, 140,542 to be precise, by 2014. This is, of course, uh, partly due to increased awareness but it is still a demand nonetheless. The early intervention of educational psychologists is critical. It's statutory also. It's part of getting it right for every child and crucial if we want to deliver the ambitions of the Children and Young People Act of 2014. The British Psychological Society highlights this, and I quote from them, it's a worrying picture given the rising levels of need among Scotland's children and young people. And they go on to say this pressure on existing services jeopardises the national policy objectives to promote early and effective intervention to support the well-being of children and young people across Scotland. Educational psychologists are vital for helping children or young people who may struggle with education. In the past, those young people felt isolated. 
felt let down by the education system and therefore by society. This often led to underachieving, frustration and low morale. Educational psychologists work in providing support for therapeutic behaviour management programmes. Personalising the needs of our young people is crucial. It is therefore vital that no matter where you are in Scotland that you have access to educational psychologists at the earliest and tamiest way possible. They provide the support that our teachers and parents need to provide the strategies that are needed for those young people to achieve, learn, participate in our education system, society and future workplace. Deputy Presiding Officer, I did mention that the supply and demand for educational psychologists is out of kilter, and part of that is uh, that we are not training enough educational psychologists for not just the rising demand, but for the ageing and retiring current psychologists. In the minutes from the 8th of March 2013 Educational Psychology Workforce Planning Meeting, the Strathclyde University representative said that he considered for their area that 20 students need to graduate from the programme each year to keep things in equilibrium. In 2013-14, it was just 17 students were on that course. The Scottish Division of Educational Psychologists report mentioned earlier also states that we need to train more. So we have to look at why, and it's been mentioned already, the Scottish Children's Services Coalition makes it clear in their briefing, and I quote again, the removal in 2012 of the bursary paid to each tra trainee by the Scottish Government, coupled with a very limited loan facility, means that new trainees need to have access to around £25,000 each year for two years to self-fund course fees, travel and living expenses. This has led to a 70% drop in applicants. Unquote. That's a poor record by this government. If we're serious about providing a statutory duty of educational psychology for our young people and children, this government has to address this imbalance of demand and supply of educational psychologists in Scotland. It's a statutory duty. Many thanks. And I now call Mark Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. I welcome the opportunity to contribute to this um, afternoon's important to debate and congratulate David Stewart and, um, like others, for, for securing the um, debate, debate on this subject this afternoon. Um, educational psychologists play a, a vital role in schools and education establishments across Scotland. I don't think that can be denied. They assist children and young people, um, many of whom are enduring deep social and emotional problems. Um, there can be no denying as well that the number of children being identified as having additional support needs has increased dramatically over the course of the last five years, more than doubling to 140,542 in 2014. It would be expected that an increase on, on that level would have led to a similar um, increase in the number of qualified professionals available to support and give assistance to those young people, their families and school staff. Now, sadly, we have heard in this afternoon debate that those figures show that that is not the case. With more than 140,000 children identified as having additional support needs, it is just counterintuitive and it is unacceptable that Scotland is only 394 full-time educational psychologist posts. The record high was 443 in 2009, and even then that was not enough, but that is then dropped by 11 per cent, and it is the, the, the case in 2015 that we only have 15 more psychologists than we did in 2001. The, the issue being so serious that um, the Scottish Children's Services Coalition noted earlier that this increase in demand, coupled with cuts to local authority budgets, uh, the withdrawal of funding for the training of educational psychologists, um, places that very profession close to a tipping point. And that, that comes one year after the report highlighted in David Stewart's motion stated that the number of trained educational psychologists is dangerously low. Now, by taking the decision in 2012 to remove the bursary paid to each trainee, the Scottish Government 
is forcing many to secure £25,000 per year of their own funding for a two-year course. That is a, a massive obstacle to those who have a, a real burning desire to enter that profession to support young people. Um, it restricts applicants and, and people from poorer communities from undertaking that, that training. And I think that 70 per cent drop in applications has been mentioned before as, as proof of that. Um, Emma Brown, who is the chair of the Educational Psychology Training Committee, quoted earlier by Malcolm Chisholm, also said that we have got significant concerns over the impact of this proposal and the potential impact upon educational psychology services ability to fill their duties locally and nationally and that significant concern seems to be borne out. It, it's also been mentioned earlier about the concern that 25 per cent of existing educational psychologists are set to retire within the next four years and while I take on board a lot of the points George Adam made about local authorities coming together to, to pool such specialist services that when you get to such a low level of educational psychologists with such a high level of demand that even authorities coming together to pool the resources really start to struggle to provide that, that service. Um, I think it is really of utmost importance that the Scottish Government takes action now to look at those, um, that 70 per cent drop in those who are entering the, the profession. Scotland remains well short of the number of educational psychologists required and the government really needs to take action to ensure that children with additional support needs, their family and the school staff uh, receive the support that really it's, it's there on a st um, statutory footing that they should get the support but the fact is that they deserve the support and they need the support and that's why uh, government should be looking at this issue again. Thank you. Many thanks. That concludes the open part of the debate and I now invite Dr Alistair Allen to respond to the debate. Dr Allen, around seven minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I welcome today's opportunity to discuss the role of educational psychologists. Uh, they make, as I think was clear from today's debate, a very significant and critical contribution to supporting children and young people with additional support needs and I value their contribution highly. I believe the motion is based on a report prepared by the profession in September 2013 at the request of the National Scottish Steering Group for Educational Psychologists, which is chaired by a senior official of the Scottish Government. The purpose of the report was to provide information about the current workforce of educational psychologists so as to inform workforce planning for the profession across Scotland. And to take up a question raised by Mary Scanlon about recent progress on all of those fronts, I can say that my officials through the, the National Steering Group have been working in close partnership with the educational psychology profession, uh, including a representative from STEP, the Scottish arm of the, the British Psychological Society, uh, also with COSLA and with ADES, Education Scotland and the universities who train educational psychologists. But the very purpose of doing all this, of course, is to ensure that within the constraints that do exist, and they are real, we anticipate and minimise any risk to educational psychology service provision. For example, by ensuring a sustainable supply of educational psychologists to meet potential future needs. And in doing so, to make interventions as necessary. The Scottish Government is funding a seconded position in the Education Scotland, within Education Scotland to work uh, in 2015 with the National Steering Group on Workforce Planning for Education Psychology Services in Scotland. I have seen the project plan for this role, which includes work to capture uh, detail on the staffing situation for education psychologists and also sampling to establish the range of work that they undertake. Now, I recognise that there has been a significant uh, increase since 2010 in the number of pupils uh, recorded uh, in national statistics as having uh, additional support needs. Uh, I don't dispute the pressures around this, although uh, I would remind all members who, who raised the, uh, the figure of a doubling uh, in uh, the number of children with uh, additional uh, support needs that this does, of course, uh, reflect a very dramatic change in the way that uh, these numbers are counted. Uh, and prior to these changes, of course, 
uh, these extra pupils were already part of the school population and were already having their additional support needs met. I will, yes. David Stewart. Coming to this, but I think the two crucial aspects are uh, reinstating the bursary, which was taken away in 2012, and having a minimum number of educational psychologists by local authority. And the analogy I'll give the Minister is look at clinical psychologists who still have a bursary, who effectively doubled their number and have a minimum number across Scotland. Take a leaf out of their book, and that's well down the route to getting this problem solved. Dr. Allen. Well, I was meeting clinical uh, psychologists at another event uh, this morning, uh, and while I understand uh, the point that the member is seeking to make, uh, I think it is important to say, and I, I will stress this, that uh, although I would freely admit that there has been a reduction in the, the number of people applying uh, for the course around educational psychology, there has not been a reduction in the number of people going through this course and, and coming out uh, as education psychologists. I understand the point the member has made, but I must make some progress, uh, not least uh, in answering the other point he made, which I'll just come to. Because it does remain, and rightly so, for local authorities to take decisions around the numbers of educational psychologists that they employ, uh, and the prioritisation and delivery of the services uh, educational psychologists provide. Now, now, Mary Scanlon asked a good question about specifically what recourse parents have uh, if local authorities fail in that duty uh, to provide services. Parents, parents do have recourse to mediation, to independent adjud adjudication, and also specifically to the additional needs tribunal uh, uh, around those important issues. Now, teaching and support staff have been trained in identifying, assessing and meeting needs, and we have developed national standards and guidance such as the Autism Toolbox and Dyslexia Toolkits to support them. This uh, does ensure that uh, the educational psychologist's work is directed at the most vulnerable uh, and uh, as time, uh, at, at a time when uh, psychological intervention can have the greatest impact. A partnership model based on needs means uh, that at each stage of intervention, children are provided with the most appropriate package of support uh, uh, that, needs, uh, that, that can be used to meet their needs. Now, the profession has uh, raised concern, to answer the second point uh, the member makes, the profession has raised concern about the impact uh, of the withdrawal of grant funding for the training of educational psychologists. Um, and the decision to reduce the funding of students uh, on educational psychology courses was made as part of the 2011 spending review to bring it in line with standard postgraduate support. And it, it must uh, be stressed, of course, this is a postgraduate course. And it is important to say uh, that... Uh, yes, uh-huh. Jenny Mara. But the Minister, I understand and I've heard this reasoning from Mike Russell before about the postgraduate course, but would the Minister accept that there is a strong vocational element to educational psychology? And if you're going to have the same funding structure for dentists and doctors and nurses to go all the way through, then a very similar funding structure should also take place for educational psychology. It really doesn't stack up to compare it to an MSc in art history or an MSc in science when there's actually a vocational uh, qualification for teaching in our schools? Minister. Well, it is important to say that the, the grant funding that was introduced was, was introduced in response to a staffing shortage uh, in the sector uh, in 1998 that by 2011, it must be said, was, was not evident in the same way. However, the Scottish budget was also facing real and significant long-term cuts in coming years and uh, very difficult decisions have had to be made around the prioritisation of spending. However, uh, in re recognition of the importance of uh, ensuring appropriate numbers of educational psychologists being trained, the student fee loan support of £3,400 uh, would be available for uh, both years of the course. This, I must make some progress now, but this, this is the only postgraduate course on the prescribed course list where this is the case. Also from the academic year 2015-16, the MSc in Educational Psychology is one of a very small number of courses on a prescribed list from which eligible students are able to apply for a living cost loan of up to £4,500 a year. Now, the National Steering Group will be interested, as will I, to see the findings uh, of new work that's being done in this area. Uh, the removal of funding has had an impact, as I say, I accept, on the numbers applying to study educational psychology. 
Um, but the numbers of applications before the removal of funding had reached uh, comparatively very high levels, uh, 212 in 2011. Point, yes. Point. The Minister has not touched on this, but I am sure he agrees with this. The crucial issue about the 70 per cent reduction in applications is that the social mix is wrong. Very few working class kids are applying. That is the problem and the effect of the removal of bursaries. Dr Allen. Well, uh, I entirely accept the argument that uh, we must do everything we can to ensure social mix in our universities. That's why, for instance, this government believes in free education for undergraduate courses. That's why we, we have uh, been uh, unambiguously behind that. Um, I think one thing I want to say, because I realise time is running out here, but one thing I want to say about the motion itself um, is that uh, I, I do uh, regret uh, and I'm saddened by, I must make progress now, I'm saddened by the suggestion in the motion that the quality of candidates training as educational psychologists has dropped. Indeed, it's more than a suggestion. To be offered a place on the MSc in educational psychology, applicants must demonstrate that they meet a prescribed standard and once accepted onto the training, uh, trainee educational psychologist must complete a very demanding and rigorous two-stage process to fully qualify. These standards have not been compromised and the movers of the motion uh, and its supporters have offered no evidence in the debate for that claim in the motion. And I also do refute the suggestion that there has been a fall in the standards of assessment of uh, additional support needs. And I am very unclear on what basis and on what evidence that claim is made around the motion. So let me put this back in context by way of uh, conclusion, presiding officer. Uh, I'd like to thank the speakers for taking part in a debate which may at points not have seemed like uh, a debate in the character of a member's debate, um, but it has been a very important debate uh, about a subject we all accept uh, is crucial to the future of Scotland and Scotland's children. Uh, again, I thank people for taking part in it. I think we have made strides forward in this area uh, and through the work we are doing are demonstrating our commitment to supporting the educational psychologist profession to provide support to all of our children and young people, and particularly those with additional support need. Thank you, Minister. That concludes David Stewart's members' debate, and I now suspend this meeting until 2 p.m. <laughs>